Hello, everybody. We are here for the fourth and final panel discussion for the Rebecoming the One free symposium, where we are in the whole symposium, we are addressing the healing of our world through the healing of gender, our relationships to gender and sexuality. And a big part of what has been coming up in all of these talks and in conversations that we've been having is the idea of transmuting the shadow. So it felt to me like it was really important to have a panel discussion really drop into what that is. In the in the panel that we that I that we just had just before this one, it was um, focusing on returning to wholeness, and a big part of what what we ended up talking about in that panel was actually grief and the need like the the role that grief plays in our healing on this planet and the fact that we this planet is in acute trauma and it has been for a long time and it just that's just reality so it feels really perfect that we'll be ending ending on this note of transmuting the shadow and um and what that means and the role that the shadow plays in all of what we're attempting to do here on this planet um and each of you are you know experts of, on this in various ways and mm -hmm. some of you have even written books on it and all these things so um but when before we start i want to drop in to a moment of silence so that we can you know acknowledge the fact that you guys are all experts and that many of the people listening are probably experts on this and and at the same time i want to hold the reality that um i would love for this conversation to include certainly any of that expertise but really also be coming from ourselves as heart and soul and spirit and um that that's really the ultimate truth of who we are um so this is there's no pressure here to be like a talking expert head <laughs> you know this is really this is really talking from the most true level of of who you are and who we all are um and as we're doing that what i would invite us all to start by doing is just coming into that moment of silence and sitting with the question of what does it mean to transmute the shadow even what is the shadow um, maybe that's even a simpler question what what is shadow to you and then we could flow into the question of transmuting uh, and i would invite anybody listening now or in the future to also drop into what is your answer around that and i would love for you to share in the chat or share in the comments on YouTube or Facebook um, and be part of this, this healing because it is a collective effort. It's not just people talking on this panel. Um, it's all of us. So you can just do, drop in for a moment. And again, come into that question of on this heart and soul level, what arises for you around the question of what is shadow? Okay, so I'm just gonna go around the circle in each see, I'll just call your name and just say what, what comes up for you around that question, what is shadow? And then we'll take the conversation from there. Um, so let's see, Nick, do you wanna go first? Um, sure, uh, for me, I come at this from a Jungian perspective. And so the shadow is everything that we repress uh, the things about ourselves that we don't like. Um, but I also think it is important to recognize that there is a positive aspect to the shadow. Um, there are things like our instincts. I think the instincts largely exist in shadow. And I think shadow can be a source of creativity. And uh, shadow always in my mind is connected to consciousness and consciousness is often uh, referred to as light. And in mythologies um, it's always the light of consciousness and in creation myths, you know, that often is the starting point. Uh, 
uh, you know, let there be light. And, you know, I think of the Orphix that they have, Fanes, the bringer of light. And we talk about the light of reason. And I think it's really important to keep in mind that every light casts a shadow and that the shadow is a vital part of the psyche. And it's a living part of the personality. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah. There'll be more space for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nikki. Yeah, when I think of the shadow, I definitely think of it multidimensionally. Uh, one of what Nick just talked about, the psychological view of the disowned parts, which is individual, right? It could be I'm repressing my anger or sadness because in my family it wasn't okay to express anger or sadness. So, And what happens is when I repress or disown parts of myself, I project them out. And that's where the fear, the judgments come out where biases, oppression comes out, you know, that's the shadow side of the repression. And that's what we have seen where people are threatened by other people's sexuality or gender definitions or assignments because they haven't owned those parts within themselves that they might have even let's say homosexual attraction, but instead of owning that in themselves, they will maybe be hateful towards someone who is homosexual openly. Um, so that's kind of the personal, and then we have of course collective and cultural shadows that are connected to the time space continuum of what's true in our cultures right now, what are our collective shadows, right? What is the, and for me, in terms of also looking at sexuality and gender, it's the norms, right? The norms of what's right and what's wrong. The heteronormativity, for example, excludes all others. So I would then claim that as a shadow. So it really, um, and how do we do, work with that shadow and the shadow doesn't exist without the light. So for me also transmuting the shadow has to do with changing it, but not denying it and that the shadow has a function. I mean, it started out as kids, we wanna be loved and belong. And the responses we got might have shut down parts of ourselves. And then I start putting that as an inner critic at beliefs and stories about myself, that I'm wrong. And so for me, the work also working, and we'll talk more about that with the shadow, has a lot to do with transforming and looking at our beliefs and stories we tell ourselves that are not about our soul or true selves. Um, so yeah, the shadow is, I really also like, and this quote just came to me today from a friend who sent it, and it's called, turn your face towards the sun and the shadows will fall behind you. And it's a Maori um, proverb. So, and I'm going to maybe stop here for now. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Cameron. I love that quote. I was just imagining myself outside and like feeling the sunlight on me and then seeing like what the shadow did. And, and so that quote really sums it up really well, but I'll say a little bit more about it. So yeah, in general, it's like wherever the light isn't being touched in my awareness. So like, let's say the sun's coming from this way. And so on this side, it's casting a shadow I mean, it's, it's really just that simple to me. And, and so also for me, I guess, to get into that a little more, it's about being able to see, not only like when it's like turning into the big bad wolf, right? Like even if you see a shadow, like it can be way bigger than you, depending on what's going on, but it also can be way smaller. And so just being able to focus on how am I casting myself big or small based off of how I'm not understanding the light of awareness that's coming through me. That's how I would work with shadow or feel into shadow after that amazing quote right there. 
Thank you, Steve. I basically echo what's already been said. My approach or take on it is that <clears throat> it is the places within us that have due to uh, conditioning, social conditioning, parental conditioning and so forth have not been supported, have been criticized, judged, um, rejected. And so it's associated with the emotions of what we were talking about before about grief, for example, is big in many people's shadow because you're not allowed to grieve. You know, you mean the person died two weeks ago and you're not over it yet, that, that sort of thing. Um, and then also the other side of it, because of the, uh, the, the critic and what I've heard some people call the committee, uh, internally, where we don't feel adequate or, uh, I don't really want to say special, but we don't feel worthy to embrace our individual unique calling, which is coming straight from the soul. And so that also goes into the shadow. I think I'll hold it at that for the moment. Thank you. Don. Yes. Um, well, I agree with all of the above. I think at the most basic level, kind of our shadow is that which we don't want to see about ourselves. So it's as, you know, uh, people have said, it's those angry, abused, traumatized, grief-stricken, judgmental, small-minded aspects of self that we keep kind of tamped down in, in the basement of our psyche, so to speak, huh? And I think as, as Nikki said, you know, we tend to, we often tend to project those qualities onto others or onto, you know, it's our parents' fault, the government's fault, big pharma, whoever you want to pick. Um, and I, I think it's, it's um, uh, uh, to me, that's always the red flag whenever I'm complaining about something or not liking something out there. Um, I think that's a clue to some aspect of shadow that we own within ourselves. Huh? Um, so for me, at, at, again, at simplest levels, um, or the starting point, I'll say, of working with shadow is to be honest with ourselves and to really see those aspects in ourselves, to begin to own them and and even embrace them because as I can't remember who said it, but um, you know, I think our shadowed selves do have gifts. They have gifts, um, you know, um, some of these traumatized selves inside shadow selves have been holding, you know, things that maybe we couldn't accept at two or three years old. Um, some of these shadow selves um, might not seem like they have gifts, like the inner bully, you know, who's acting out in inappropriate ways, but can help other shadow selves, for example, the victim, um, learn to speak up for herself and to help others. So I think a lot of, uh, for me, what a lot of shadow work is, number one, being honest with the self, um, using clues to find out what our shadow is and to begin to integrate it, to really invite the shadow in, to talk with it, to find out what those pieces are and how we can integrate it into the light of our consciousness. And again, I also agree with, I'm sorry, I can't remember who said it either, but you know, we have these personal shadows, we have collective, cultural, religious, you know, all these different shadow selves. Um, every kind of group, as well as every individual, holds holds a shadow self, and um, and uh, my interest is really reclaiming the gifts of the shadow, and and learning from the shadow. Mm -hmm. And and in a minute, I want to come back to you, Don, because I'm getting very specific. Anyway, you're literally writing a book on shadow animals right now, <laughs> or about right, to. Go right. Right. Yeah. Anyway, so I, anyway, I want to come back to something, but. Um, Let's go to Vivian. I also echo what everyone said. And I think that's indicative that the shadow is not simplistic, that there are nuances, there are facets, there are fractals. It's, it's very um, multidimensional. 
And for me, I see a tender part of the shadow as being about an attempt for safety that a lot of the shadow is based in a fear response. I don't know that, so it might hurt me. I'm afraid of it, so I'm gonna repress it. I'm gonna reject it. I'm gonna label it as bad or wrong or shameful. And so it gets, it can get convoluted into really unhealthy beliefs, behaviors, actions, but the tender root is this sense of looking for safety that somehow some way what i am denying rejecting and not seeing within myself or other has some sort of sense of fear or threat to me even if it's not true but the shadow acting out of a place of protection that again bringing the light in realizing you know and dawn as you spoke to about there's the gifts of well yeah this is if i flip how i'm approaching it and also Cameron, like when you were talking about, well, looking where the light of illumination isn't hitting, again, it's not something harmful or scary. It's going into that which, for whatever reason, we're afraid to or fear harm exists. So that's the, the tender part of shadow that I like to bring out along with supporting everyone else's beautiful articulation and interpretation of what the shadow is for them. Beautiful. Yeah. So the thing that the thing sticking out to me in everything here is that idea of the gift of the shadow. And I would love, I mean, I'm just, I'm looking around at each of you and I'm thinking you each in your own ways work with very consciously work with the shadow and very consciously work with the gift of the shadow, um, each in di very different ways, but, um, like even Nick in your your academic work, like even in the talk that you did with me, which was mind-blowingly phenomenal, <laughs> you know? Oh my goodness. Everyone, I just say it 42 times. I've said this word already all day. 42 times. Everyone needs to watch this talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, every single one of you. So um, yeah, I would love for you each to however you're you feel called to speak to it what, what in your your work in the world or in your life personally or both um i know that you each value the shadow and you each value the gift of the shadow so in whatever way you feel called just speak to how that plays out for you um in what you offer in the world or who you are or both but who wants to go first <laughs> Yeah, I'm happy to go and I actually want to add another piece and um, to just highlight it and it was spoken and touched upon but the shadow is so individualistic right so it might be even something positive that's in the shadow that's considered positive like you know I have repressed my own sense of humor and I see somebody else humoristic oh, wow, you know, I can only see it out there, but not inside of me. So that's also part of the shadow. So it's sometimes harder to talk about, okay, what's the shadow work? Because as a therapist, I do work with, you know, the anxiety, depression, trauma, and then also the parts of ourselves that tell us we're not enough or we are too much. And that is kind of the belief structures that I collected a story rather than the direct experience of myself. So a lot of transmuting the shadow is about naming, acknowledging the stories, the beliefs I have about myself, the world and how it should be. And then looking, can I transform them into more positive stories or this knowing they're just stories and beliefs, they are not who I am. So it's a continuous work around being curious, being compassionate with all of us, right? When somebody irritates me, it's probably highlighting something I can own in myself. You know, I get triggered by people who are entitled, let's say. 
because I was never allowed to have my own needs or to voice them or to assert them. And so that's part of my work is then, oh, wait a moment, it's okay to have needs. It's okay to assert them. I might judge this person who's very vocal and assertive. Um, so this is part of transmuting, you know, learning. Okay, this is the part that has been really difficult for me because I have been rejected. But how can I turn that rejection into loving myself with that need? Another big one that I'm often working with right now is anger and frustration and sometimes the you know, the coding has been, it's more acceptable in men and almost to express anger, to be, and women struggle with it more often in my experience. But at the same time, I think it also goes beyond the gender where people struggle with that energy of anger while anger itself is an energy that moves through us, that helps us to understand our boundaries that can be an amazing wisdom teacher. And so it is about like, can I allow the anger? Because when it's repressed, that's when it turns into violence. So allowance, curiosity, breathing, so we can go into another part of our brains to respond, laughter. And for me as an expressive art therapist, using all kinds of arts to express and be with it all without a judgment and yeah the power of no judgment is actually for me a transmuting factor not judging myself or others but we're not there so we also have to acknowledge the judge i'm gonna stop right there <laughs> yes and and um so much of what you are saying is what Vivian spoke to in her talk on the dark <laughs> goddess. And so just immediately thinking of you, Vivian, over and over again, I don't know if you want to take a turn next, but um, yeah. if you do feel free. <laughs> yeah. So my, the way that I work with the shadow is with the dark goddess. And for me, that's looking at, again, expressions that are, that can be considered taboo or scary and, so the wrath, the overt sexuality, the blood, sex, death that's in there. And it's an access point to a lot of power, which is one of the reasons why it gets put into the shadow realm of, well, you don't want to touch that. You don't want to get too close to that. There's too much power there. It's too overwhelming. Um, someone that's tapped into that cannot be controlled. And it's safer if everyone can be controlled. So we're just not going to go there. And so my work is with specifically with the divine feminine aspect of what happens when we integrate the, the shadow aspects of sex, sexuality, pleasure, naming that, owning it, having, you know, limitless amounts of that. What happens when we integrate anger? And that anger can lead to positive action, social justice, the changing of systems that are not helpful or healing or working. It can, anger can lead to seeking justice when you tap into it in its healthy form. In its toxic form, it turns into revenge of I just want to get back. So again, there's this discernment and navigating because everything has two poles but it's it doesn't mean that you just reject the whole thing entirely it's going into that and what does it look like in these various expressions and reveling in it because it's to me when i think about the dark goddess and getting into the realms of blood sex death wrath rage it's like a kid jumping into a swimming pool of mud and getting to get messy and play and giggling while everyone outside is like, no, you're getting dirty. No, don't mess that up. No, and it's like, and I'm just cackling. This is so much fun. You should be here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a little tidbit of how I like to play with the shadow in the guise of the divine feminine. 
and the dark goddess. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I can relate to all of that so strongly. <laughs> yeah, I had an experience a few days ago, actually, of just, I really felt my Lilith self. Like, mm -hmm. very, it was just all there, and I just went with it. And I was like, whoa, I like this. <laughs> this is really, and I happened to be with someone who was very able to meet me with that. So I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Nikki, I mean, yeah, it, when you're talking about reclaiming these parts of ourselves, I mean, that, that was what was coming up for me personally was this Lilith feeling, this like, Lilith experience I had the other day, you know, where if I hadn't, if I didn't realize, oh, it's okay to be this intense, powerful, sexual, uh, dark, quote unquote, dark, feminine. I don't need to always be sweet and nice and receptive and pleasing and all that, you know, um, I would be really sad if I didn't know that that was an option. <laughs> um, yeah, awesome. And that's just one example of so many and, you know, not only within the feminine, but everything. Who wants to go next? Cameron. Yeah, I guess I can piggyback <laughs> off that because, um, yeah, just in my practice and working with so many Black women over the last like six, seven years, you know, it's like it's been interesting how I've been able to talk to women about how, like, you know, you were just saying something about being receptive, right? And how um, a lot of times people will see it as being docile. But being receptive also means that this energy is moving through me right now and I'm going to do what the fuck I want to do with it, right? Mm -hmm. So like being able to like hold a container for mm -hmm. someone to like do that and be in that yeah. um, in any variety or shape or form, I think that's like what I'm, I'm here for that. Mm -hmm. I'm here for that, you know? And yeah, not, not even just hearing hearing what everyone was just saying, I was even feeling like how in the climate that we're in and like the ideas around like toxic masculinity and stuff like that, like that is an idea and how me, myself, like at times I even personally became docile. So I'm like, oh, I should just be over here and blah, blah, blah. And I've done, and I did it so many times that I actually like wasn't protecting people that I should have been protecting and being more directive about or telling them what to do, like literally telling them what to do because I didn't want to be big, bad, masculine man. You know, it's like, and, and like, it was crazy because like, that is a gift that I have to provide clarity for people very often. And so I allowed that to go into shadow, um, but allowing that to be my teacher, you know? And from, I haven't heard anybody talk about astrology. So I'll go from an astrology lens as well. Um, when I'm thinking about shadow and taboo, someone said taboo is, I'm feeling like Scorpio energy there. And in astrology, for people who don't know, there's, there's these aspects that are actually considered to be non-aspects or things that we can't see called inconjunctions. And the inconjunctions to Scorpio are to Aries. And Aries is about this primal awareness, this instinct, right? It's just in us. And when we're younger, we all just have that instinct. And then what happens when we touch the hot thing? No, don't do that. What happens when we take our clothes off? No, don't do that. What happens when we say the word bastard? No, don't do, you know, like all these things that in conjunction and it creates a blind spot and we start to repress our instincts, which is really how we're supposed to be learning how to become in every moment. And then the other in conjunction being Gemini about play and how people label things. So if I'm curious and I wanna play, but somebody else labels this bad, then that also sends things into shadow. So it's the blind spot of Scorpio being the Gemini and the Aries energy that oftentimes um, I look at it in people's charts. Also, often I'll also look at um, the first house, the third house, and the eighth house and see how those things are working in someone's psyche and consciousness and allowing the um, light to be put on it. And even like having people play with it, it's like, go lay down and see how long you can figure out where your shadow is at. Close your eyes for three minutes, you open your eyes back up, your shadow went somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So if you're not in active motion and play with, with it, then you're going to just keep creating new shadows or you're going to keep casting it in different directions um, because it's always changing it's always moving and it's like someone said earlier it's it's a part of us it's not um it's not actually even separate um when we get down to the truth of the truth um, so we have to be mindful of that too you know like coming back to the wholeness and then also differentiating it so that's what i would say love it, mm -hmm. I love it. thank you 
Um, Don or Nick or Steve? Yeah, I can. Nick, go for it. Um, sure. Um, I, I agree with everything that's been said. And one of the things that I was really thinking of is um, compassion, uh, which I know is already mentioned. And that's one of the ways that I try to work with the shadow because, you know, again, we've also talked about projection here. And uh, one of the things I was thinking of in terms of how to define transmuting the shadow was experiencing the other as yourself. Mm -hmm. And so recognizing all of those things in others that I don't like to turn it back onto myself and to see how I exhibit those. Um, and I think that doing that, you know, it helps me become aware of my own shadow, but at the same time, it helps me develop compassion for the other. And it helps me develop forgiveness for the other. And it also, you know, the treasure of it, I think, is that it gives an expanded sense of self and helps encourage ideas of interconnection. Absolutely. Yeah, and I'm just thinking of a little bit of in your talk, which was, uh, remind me of the exact name, witches? Oh, uh, witches, <laughs> science, and the inquisition of nature. Yeah, seriously epic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just, I mean, one tiny little snippet out of it taken out of context, so it might not even, anyway, uh, you were, we were talking a little bit about the Salem witch trials and how, mm -hmm. you know, you have family who would have been right. on right. either end maybe of that and how we all have in our own ancestry, in our own lineage, right. the shadow and mm -hmm. the light and the perpetrator and the victim, you know, all it's, mm -hmm. it's all there. Um, and yeah, anyway, there, your talk was yeah. way more than just that, but yeah. th that's just one thing jumping right. out of me. Yeah, and recognizing that I think was very important. Um, and uh, I think that gets into our collective shadow. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'll keep this very, very brief, but you know, my ancestors at one point were the predominant Puritan family in the colonies. And I remember thinking, oh, well, they were Puritans, they were pastors, you know, we really, could just brush our hands from the evils of slavery and then i found some horrific information about them and i couldn't and i always take the approaches we need to dig deep because that's there and we you know i don't feel guilt about what my ancestors did but i think it's important collectively to acknowledge that um, and that is i think part of shadow work absolutely especially on a collective level on this planet right mm -hmm. now it's yeah yes, what else is there? We have to address it all for sure. Yeah. My opinion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Steve or Don? Sure, I'll talk. Um, <clears throat> so as you mentioned before, yeah, I've really been involved um, uh, thinking about the shadow, working about the shadow, working with the shadow the last two years. I wrote a book about shadow animals. And so while it's really a book about the human shadow, um, I was using animals as a way to kind of soften it and to help um, my readers, you know, learn more about the shadow and see how we project. We really project onto people, but we project onto animals a lot too. You know, there's certain animal villains out there, you know, snakes and bats and rats. Mm -hmm. And yet these animals have tremendous gifts um, that they can share with us. So anyway, um, I had 13 different chapters because I just love the idea of 13 chapters in a book about the shadow. <laughs> so there's 13, and they end in an exercise. So there's 13 different ways kind of of working with the shadow. And the one that comes to mind um, as other people speak is, um, it's probably one of my favorite. It's called Sitting with Dog. You know, and dog is kind of the archetypal um, uh, representative of, un of unconditional love, even though there are shadow aspects of dog, of course, too. But anyway, I and I'm a dog person. I love, uh, I've always had dogs and I love to sit with my dog. And just to share one of the personal things that um, I find really helpful um, in working with my own shadow when something triggers me is um, to get really quiet and to sit with, um, with that emotion 
and not to try to figure it out, to not uh, uh, or, or not to um, try to discern where it came from or to become, you know, it, it's really easy to kind of get into that mental thing of you're giving yourself justification of why you were outraged about blah, 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 right? You know, so to short circuit that, um, the way I do it is to get really quiet and to feel it in my body because I think that's where it kind of begins and we feel it somewhere. And if you pay attention, um, you know, clenched jaw, butterflies in the stomach, tight chest, headache, whatever it is, you know, and to really sit with that. And it does become a meditative practice to sit with that uncomfortable energy of the shadow because it's, it's our body sharing that uncomfortable energy of what uh, we're experiencing. And the interesting thing that happens is that the longer you sit with that, and often it's not even more than a few minutes, it begins to dissipate. Mm. It begins to kind of go like this. And, you know, I've been doing this a long time. So for me, it, it's often very quick, but even, even for beginners, and it's, it, it can happen very quickly where we, by listening to our body, by listening to the shadow, it begins to release, it begins to soften. And I think we begin to soften and we begin to then be able to engage in a more um, um, meaningful, helpful way, um, the information that that shadow has to bring to us and just to bring it full circle to the gift that it has to share with us and how we can um, um, integrate that in a, in a, a, a more conscious way. And by doing that, you know, I mean, this is true with all kind of spiritual practices, but by doing it ourselves, we do it for other people. You know, we're putting out that vibration and other people are picking up on it and, and we're all helping each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just want to highlight something about your talk and your work also um, is coming to me. The book that I read of yours that you sent for me to read for your talk is about snake. Oh, right. And yeah. Yeah. And I mean, amazing. You're such a beautiful writer. Wow. Such a, such a beautiful book on so many levels. Highly recommend it. Um, but one of the things that stuck out to me in that book that I feel like I should say is, for example, when we're talking about snakes, as you pointed out, a lot of us freak out about getting killed by a snake bite or something. Right. But statistically, actually, <laughs> this is the most hilarious thing to me ever. And Nick, Nick interviewed Don, which is how I found Nick, <laughs> Nick already knows this, but actually statistically in the United States, at least, right? Uh, death by cow, <laughs> higher than death by snake. It's four times higher than death by snake. Yeah, that is the US only. You know, if you're looking at India or some other place, it's, my, it's, it's a different story. But yeah, we, we have very low um, <laughs> fatality by snake bite here. Hilarious! Yeah. You're more four times more likely to die because of a cow, yeah, than because of a snake. Yeah. <laughs> ah, wow. You know. Anyway, I just think that says a lot, <laughs> right there. Um, yeah. Well, it says a lot about our fear, and I, I forgot who was talking about the fear, but yeah, I think that's a driving force a lot of times for us of what we shove down into that the basement of our psyche and and make shadow material. It's right. fear, you know, fear drives us. And I mean, again, just to bring this full circle to what's going on today in the world, I mean, fear is a driving source. So the more we can release fear within ourselves and help other people to release it, you know, then we can maybe tackle this collective shadow, this dark collective shadow that's happening all over. Right. And then, and then also such a powerful part of what you speak to that I think is relevant here uh, that we talk about in that book and then you talk about in our talk on the symposium is that if you go back in history the um the mythology and the associate the things associated the feelings associated with snake actually used to be very positive yeah. very healing very transformative um it had a you know many 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 deep ancient gifts in it actually right. so this fear that we have is largely illusion mm. and if we are able to drop it we have this wealth like this gold mine you know right at our fingertips um i, I just 
but I can't help but think that's like such a metaphor for some. You know, but that's really a great, a great uh, image you have because it brings to mind buried treasure, which is what the shadow is. It's the oh. treasure that's buried and we don't know about it until we're willing to dig deep. Yeah. So, that's it. Oh, wow. I love that. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that too. I just, that big epiphany right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, so hopping onto the buried treasure, then that makes me think of, uh, the the terma the treasure that we ourselves buried like our souls buried for us to find in mm -hmm. our own current life path mm -hmm. so it's the treasure that we buried for ourselves mm -hmm. and our path is what leads us to it mm -hmm. oh nice. i want to come back i want to give steve a chance to talk and then i want to come back yes <laughs> oh my goodness that's amazing steve yeah i want to start with a few comments um, on what's been said. Snake in India is Kundalini. Mm -hmm. um, what else? I, I was struck when Cameron was talking about how people look at the shadow separate from themselves, because what came to me was thinking that the shadow is separate from us is the shadow. Mm. <laughs> yeah. um, and then so my comments are um, on this transmute the sh the shadow. My terms. This is this is all, what I'm about to say. All here comes from my personal journey, healing, whatever you know, awareness, ongoing. So I look at it as embrace our shadow. See, even the term transmute the shadow, the, and I'm not criticizing anything. Yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> the, the shadow itself is impersonal. Mm -hmm. And it is because the way to me that we would transmute our shadow is to embrace our shadow, which means to actually find love, acceptance, uh, forgiveness, of uh, the curiosity, the desire to understand. The other piece, Dawn was speaking about how if you sit feeling what's in your body for a little while, it dissipates. And uh, this taps on uh, some work or practices that my uh, partner is, is very uh, involved with. And I would say that the, the reason it dissipates is because the real thing all those parts are doing down there in the shadow is they want to be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. They've been ignored, repressed, criticized, rejected. And so if I'm sitting there feeling what's going on in my body, I'm actually acknowledging what's going on. And that in itself is the healing and that in itself is the embracing because we're all conditioned to push the thing to stay as far away from any of it as we possibly can. But, you know, for me, what I've discovered that underneath all of it, for me, I'm not saying this through for everybody, is um, shame and inadequacy, guilt, the feeling, the sense of doing it wrong. Um, and so what I'm finding for embracing the shadow is to practice not pushing those parts away, but to become more comfortable with them, to create a relationship with them uh, where they feel safe enough to come out. One of the pieces that has recently for me is my increasing realization, I call it in a nutshell, life is inherently messy. Um, we have these, our conditioning has these belief that there's some kind of perfection. I mean, it was been my life thing, you know, I'm going to get to a point where I've done enough healing that I'm not going to be, these things are going away. So my realization is they're not going away and they're not supposed to be going away. But what can change is my relationship to their being there. This is just the way it is at this point in time on the planet, we got 7 billion people all dealing with their own version of the same thing. So one of my things is when 7 billion people 
experience something, it cannot be an accident or a mistake. So it's kind of reframing the way we view it, the way I view these parts in myself and uh, becoming friendly with them and looking for the gifts they're giving. Some, as someone mentioned, parts of them are just trying to protect or take care of me based on past experiences I have had that I'm projecting out of fear onto what's coming up next. And other parts are the parts where I'm afraid to, who am I to say this or that, or put myself out in an area where I feel uncomfortable, out of my comfort zone. So uh, that's my take, thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Steve. Um, so the thing coming to me is that, uh, yeah, being on this planet, again, is you know incredibly difficult, very easily overwhelming. There's so much shadow coming out of every pore of everything, it seems like, right? It's just like, it's just going and going, like there's more and more and more <laughs> coming up. Um, and so one of the things that Nikki and I talk about and her in your talk, Nikki, is from the perspective of both of us have a lot of experience being therapists, working with trauma from a clinical perspective. And so a lot of what she and I ended up talking about, we weren't really planning to talk about this in her talk, we ended up talking about a lot of just kind of like um, the basics of some some really key things to remember when we are dealing with trauma, which is like, number one, don't go for the jugular, like like that, that dealing with these these shadows in ourself and in our world can overwhelm us to the point that we can't be functional right so so i mean the one thing i just want to name again i'm feeling like i just need to name that is that i would say one really key thing with this whole process is to be very clear and very aware of what is right for us each in every moment and to be addressing whatever that is and only that <laughs> right in that moment but on a bigger level, I would love to hear from any of you, um, again, thinking about, about that big perspective of we are on this planet, there is all this shadow, there is all this trauma. What comes to mind or what advice would you have for people to, to take like just one step, like if they're going to do one thing in their life right here and right now um, or tomorrow or today or whatever it is, what would you say to that, you know, to, to address the shadow, to address the trauma, to try to make change in themselves and in the world? Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Nick? Uh, well, this is what came to mind, and I hope it's not too much of a diversion here, but <laughs> one of the, well, one of the things I'm always thinking about is the state of the world, especially our ecological crisis. And I do see that as the shadow that it is, you know, the, the earth is sick and that represents a sickness within humanity. And I think that there is a history to that. And the, what I want to suggest is this history goes back at least to the Greeks and the philosophy of Plato. And, um, you know, for Plato, this world is unimportant. What's important is this transcendental reality. And what is symbolized there is the sun. And, and I think there's this focus with the sun and reason and light and a denial of this world and a denial of our animality. And what Plato throws into this mix is this idea of knowledge, of gnosis. And this is in the language of awakening. And I've noticed that people have, we, we use that language and I won't get into it, but I think it is archetypal. I think it is part of the human experience, but it is connected to these ideas of knowledge and certainty. And I think that the best thing that people can do is 
recognize that that is probably illusory that the light also has its own you know it has the shadow and so the best thing that i think people can do is avoid thinking that they know everything <laughs> avoid thinking in terms of certainty and get comfortable in writing or surfing the waves of uncertainty mm. awesome thank you and I know, Don, you're going to have to leave in a few minutes. You want to go next? I am. I just want to say I love that answer. That's um, I, I so agree. And um, yeah, the thing that came to me when you first asked the question, Martha, is is self-honesty, mm -hmm. just being comfortable with who we are and what we know and that it's OK to say we don't know. And it's liberating. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> You know, I'm just reminded, this is just so funny and I don't know where I came from, but I spent some time in India and the specific little village I came with, the people were just so friendly. And if you asked where to go, where, you know, directions to somewhere, they would tell you, even if they didn't know, they would give you directions to somewhere. And so, you know, it, it almost feels like sometimes we're living that, you know, there, there has to be an answer, even if it's wrong, it's okay, it's an answer, right? Because we feel more comfortable with that, um, with knowledge or with um, that idea of that illusory idea of knowledge. And um, so I think, hmm, I don't want to say this, um, transmuting the shadow is maybe about um, letting go of thinking a little bit you know, kind of sink deep down like we did in the beginning, sinking down into that silent space and just being. And I do think there are a lot of people who are uncomfortable with just being, you know, my family, they love to have the radio on at the television. Not my, not my family here, but my, my uh, original family. And, you know, that would drive me crazy. I just like the silence and there's, there's a letting go in the silence, huh? And in being and in, um, and in not thinking, so. Yeah, absolutely. And in the last, the previous panel with uh, talking about returning to wholeness, we talked a lot about the need to come, that we've been so stuck in the left brain, intellectual, analytical way of thinking. Like Nick, your talk is very, 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 very related to that. Um, and that, you know, hopefully we're making a shift to remembering that we are infinite. We're infinity, literally we're everything and, and the need for us to drop into that reality as we navigate the world and the healing and the, also the activism that we feel called to do in the world. Hmm. We spoke about that a lot in the last panel. Um, if anybody's interested and haven't, hasn't seen, have not seen that one yet. Yeah. Can I just say goodbye and thank yeah. you so much. I loved meeting everybody and Martha, you're great and take care. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Yeah, what I don't know, Cameron, you looked like you wanted to say something too, but I'm ready to jump in, but I don't know if you might want to go first. It's your world, I'm just leaving it. Have at it. <laughs> I mean, when I'm thinking, and also thank you, Nick, for naming the global climate change crisis that we are all facing as a species of humans, you know, um, I think Earth will survive. We humans might not, but. <laughs> Anyway, and we do need to develop a different relationship than we have lived in the last whatever, how many years to our own bodies that are part of nature and we are nature. So that coming back to that understanding is transmuting the shadow of our separation that brought us to the place where we're at. And I really also, but often what happens, people feel I'm not enough. I can't change. There are people hungry in the world. You know, I grew up with a saying of like, you better finish your plate because there are people starving in the third world. That's how I grew up, which left guilt feelings, which wasn't very helpful. And when we're in that place of the guilt feelings, we are often paralyzed or the shame. And it, feel like we're not enough to make a change but i do like what gandhi says be the change you want to see in the world yeah. and what does that mean or even you know michael jackson's song look in the man in the mirror anyway but it's like 
what does it mean to be the change, right? I can have all kinds of ideas how the world should function, how the world should be, but start here. <laughs> and to me, I mean, things were named already, the compassion, curiosity, finding someone who can work with you because it's so hard when we are in these dark places with ourselves, it's hard to pull ourselves out of them. So being with someone you can trust, who can hold space for you to also witness being in the darkness, whatever the darkness represents to you, mm. the shame of collected stories, the intergenerational trauma. I mean, my own healing was a lot about intergenerational trauma since I grew up in Germany after the Second World War, you know, and processing First World War, Second World War, the Holocaust, all of these things. And what I saw was that the guilt, while it created changes in the society in many ways, and I think the German government has quite done some, it also, again, paralyzed and traumatized other people. Hmm. So continuously understanding it's not about changing something out there but the more you are changing inside of you and working with whatever trauma you might be holding or carrying from your ancestors the more it will shift in your life the way you relate to yourself and to others and so i am a big advocate for doing the self-work and if you are mobilized and balanced, do the activism. Mm -hmm. But a lot of activists burn out because often it ex it's just externalized. So, and as a healthcare profe uh, professional, whatever practitioner, I have to teach myself constantly that I need to be resourced in order to sit with others. So mm -hmm. me, my continuous healing also as a person who provides healing spaces, you know, is essential. And the way I replenish myself in the face of all the dilemmas in the world is to be in nature, to move, to dance, to ride, to draw, to talk to people that love me, mm -hmm. to be with pets. Anyway, I could go on and on, but I'm going to stop right here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Everything. Someone else want to speak up? I'll say a little bit. I mean, to me, there is, I don't feel there's an answer to the question because I don't think there's a collective response that fits everyone. I feel like every, I look at people as souls and that we're on a soul journey and each of us is totally unique. Um, I, each each person here obviously feels called from within. Uh, their life brought them to certain places that we're doing what we're doing. And undoubtedly, we've all had our own individual uh, suffering and you know miscues along the way in terms of finding our path, which clearly is not, there's no end point to it. So, I mean, for me, you know, I'm, I'm a counseling astrologer and uh, I basically point people to their own path. I mean, I've been getting clearer and clearer. The pain and suffering and false starts and confusion and uncertainty that we experience are not mistakes, but are totally part of the path of unfolding that, that we're walking. The, the issue really is that we don't collectively understand this. The, the uh, statement about getting comfortable with uncertainty and very much at home for me. I mean, I have, I've been on a personal journey of that. And when I was first going through it, which was very frightening, I came up with that I'm getting comfortable with feeling uncomfortable. That the uncertainty is at the points where our soul is taking us out of known terrain into unknown terrain. And there isn't really a way that that can feel safe and uh, uh, secure, but it's more like the, the missing piece for me, as I am discovering it, is that life is safe 
and that life is on my side. And it's very easy to grow up in our world the way it is now and not feel that and feel that things are happening to me, which we can sit there and say, well, that's a victim state. But based on the perspective people have to live with, to work with, that's the way it feels to them. And so it's through understanding the deeper perspective that like a mom who in order to be a good mom sometimes has to make her children who she dear, deeply loves do things that that child is not going to like. That is gonna be uncomfortable, but that child needs to do those things. If, if she didn't, I can't say make, but encourage them to do that, that she wouldn't really be a good mom because the child wouldn't be prepared in a mature way for things that are coming up. And so, I mean, to me, life is preparing each of us for this and that our function at this point in time and, and all the craziness that's going on, the fear, the reaction and all this to me are the signs of the awakening that's going on because it's the people that are freaking out inside from what they can't face and from what the change they see that is slipping away and making the life they thought they wanted to live uh, not livable. But I, but that more, you know, not everybody's going to get this by any means at this point in time. But many people to me are, are waking up and can understand that we're being brought uh, closer and closer to where we're intended to be from the soul perspective and that the healing of the shadow embracing the shadow is a very important part of that because it's out of that that the trust in life that life really is on my side even when things that come up are very very painful and, un and unwanted by any sane person doesn't want certain things to happen but they do at times so that anyway, that's kind of the way that I direct people that it's a very individual thing and to support people on their individual unique pathway, which may, often is not mine at all, but it is clearly theirs. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Um, Cameron or Vivian. I can go. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. right, cool. um, I wanted to touch on something Nick was saying. Uh, uh, it was something about uh, the darkness uh, I was feeling into. I, I can't recall what it was exactly, but there was a practice that I was thinking about that I used to do. And obviously invitation to do this, if you can do it in any way that's safe or feels true for you, um, but it was, I would just go out at night into this, this like woods, air, this wooded area. And I would just, I did it for a few moon cycles and just to experience what does it feel like to have the half moon there and kind of have light versus having no light there. Mm -hmm. And like project, and then I, and I would have my flashlight with me just as a play. And it's like, how scary is it for a branch to fall off a tree and to project a coyote being there? You know, it's like, or, or when, when, the, when the light is there, the full moon, I could just walk. Cause it's like, it's kind of dark, but I can see here. So I feel kind of comfortable. And like, how is that being experienced in my everyday waking life? You know, and just like actually having the experience of it, like actually like clinching when it's like, I think something's there. I don't know what it is. And that's actually the thing that I'm scared of because I turn the light on and it's a cricket or it's, it's like, it's like, whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is. It's like, but being able to experience that is something that I found that was really, really profound for me and allowed me to drop more further into a process where I also was like receiving a lot of information when I was going into these meditations. And what I was continuously being directed to tell people was they would always say like, Cameron, you never have to be confused. Humans never have to be confused. And they say, you never have to be confused because you can know that you don't know. As a way of knowing, you can know that. And in that process, you can unclench 
and, and, and have the ability and free energy to figure it out rather than utilize vital force repressing and holding. We use much more energy holding things down than we do even expressing things. And so for people to be able to get into their body and feel that, a lot of times I would say that practice that I just said, if somebody can access that in a safe way, but also I have had some people where I just tell them, drink hot water and just feel where the hot water goes in your body that hasn't been touched. Mm. What does it feel like for you to start getting sweaty and uncomfortable? What is that bringing up out of you? Because no, in that process, you're igniting Agni and the Agni is like the metabolic fire. And by igniting that metabolic fire, you're beginning to digest and process things in your physical body and that inherently will move into your emotional body, to your mental body. And also saying all these things as an invitation for everyone to take everything I just said and creatively make your own way of doing that exact thing up for yourself. And, and, and I don't usually say that at the end, but Steve said it perfectly because it is everybody's individual journey. So also whenever we're sharing, inviting everyone to at the end put, how, does that, how, do, how would that look for you? So that people can like have a way to like explore that further than you know, the way I came to it and like the, the specific medicines that I share with others because everybody has that medicine already. And so, yeah, that's what I would say. Vivian. To reflect back on all the amazing wisdom that has been shared by each of you, my answer to how you work with the shadow is reiterating what you've already said of, I don't know. I don't know what works for you, you know, and, and that's, you know, Nick talked about going into the unknown and being okay to saying, I don't know. And, you know, Steve, you know, you were talking about the, the individual path and Nikki, like with your creativity work and like, that's not controlled. That's not known. Each person's creative process is their own and unknown until it is done. And Cameron, we, we, you just, beautifully stated in summary and closing and how you offered what was on your path but invite people to take it and play with it and make it their own because yes so i believe everyone's wisdom is i don't know <laughs> it's your path <laughs> yeah you want to say something nikki yeah i would like to add something i love the way you just kind of all threaded it all together and yeah it is an individual path for sure but the two words that were coming to me now were about externalization and illumination mm. and bringing the light to the dark whatever the dark is in you or is in a way and this is where the arts for me come in you can externalize the things you're afraid of so you don't carry it all inside of you you know, that's where sculpture comes in. That's where other ways of externalizing it. So it's not running you anymore. So you can illuminate it, whatever is hidden in the dark that is not seen, not lived, not owned, you know, but to illuminate, I mean, with us speaking, having the panel, the symposium, it's an illumination, right, of different ways of finding ways of making the unconscious conscious you know the shadow if we think of shadow as unconscious or subconscious whatever but yeah so that for me and that has also been the work in terms when we look at collective shadow work you know looking at intergenerational trauma looking at the scars of slavery of um you know internment camps of the holocaust all of that it's so important i mean i grew up watching and i don't know if that's always good and that goes back to your point you made earlier martha around not overwhelming people right because mm -hmm. we as children grew up watching holocaust concentration movies fifth grade on well 
is debatable, you know, was that the right thing for people or not in order to reconcile our history and understand what was happening in Germany before we were born. But for some people, it over, it was traumatizing as a young soul watching, you know, people in the gas chambers and all of that. And so there's a question, you know, how do we really work also with the trauma, the collective trauma in ways? And yeah, each has their own path, but definitely also pacing and being really aware of what's happening inside your body, because that's where the wisdom is. And that's also where the trauma is stored. You know, working with the body is essential in my eyes. Definitely. Yeah, and I could just throw in again, you know, having worked with, I don't know, thousands of kids who were in the foster care system, every kid, they could have had the exact same thing done to them and every kid will be reacting differently and every kid will need something different. And the true, that's true for all of us, right? It's like we can't, and we can't, no one else can know really what we need. It's so much, one step I would say is absolutely coming into the body, coming into ourselves and being at peace, I mean, trying to just have compassion for where, wherever we are in that moment, meeting ourselves where we are. Um, yeah. Beautiful, thank you. Um, so to close, we're not only closing this panel, but we're also gonna be closing this whole symposium. So um, if you guys are up for this, I would love to, at the end of the other panels, what I did was, have each speaker drop in again and and give a prayer regarding the theme of the panel um or say a word or two regarding the theme of the panel what i'm thinking maybe would be great for this panel since it's the ending of the whole symposium is if we could each drop in and um speak a prayer or words or whatever that are sending the healing of this panel and the, you know, the transmuting the shadow or the embracement, embracing our shadow or whatever words you want to put to it, but also prayers for the healing of, again, our relationships to gender, sexuality, love, and life itself, the whole picture of the whole symposium um, and the healing of our world and, and every level with regard to our relationship to this planet, the hurting of our planet itself, racism, violence, wars, all of the above. Um, anything that comes to you that you feel called to, to say to, to, to end the, to close the container of this symposium and then send it into the world. Um, that's how I would love to end with you guys. If that's okay. Uh, and I'll just say on a practical note before we do that, um, I'll say more in an email to everybody, but I there's a ton of energy in this this whole symposium. There's, I mean, the Divine Masculine <laughs> panel this morning did not want to stop. It's like there's like a need, an intense need on on for so many of these topics for more and more and more. And I am very committed to being present to do more on all in all kinds of ways. So there will definitely be more, and I would love to hear from people what what's needed next like what do you personally need next what do you think our world needs needs next um and and one thing i am going to be doing i'll just say it right here is that i am continuing i'm going to be continuing to do more interviews over the coming year and then next year i think there's going to be a part two of this symposium but one of the big topics that i feel like i want to flesh out more in the coming months um is the connection between this healing of our relationship to gender and sexuality to anti-racism work and to environmental justice and to you know work with trying to create peace instead of war on this planet all of all of the social justice environmental justice issues i i would i'm going to be really looking to interview people who are doing work with those things on a very real level and i already have a, a handful of people i'm going to be interviewing but if anybody knows of anyone who would be perfect for that please let me know. Um, anyway, yeah, so more to come for sure. Um, and 
any burning thing you want to say before we go into the prayer? Nikki, did you want to say something or you just? I mean, it's part of the prayer, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure if I could say a bunch of stuff, but. Yeah. Also. Yeah. No, the, the, these, all of these panels could have gone on for like five days. <laughs> and I'm thinking next year when we do part two, like maybe there needs to be more time for these conversations because it seems like there's a lot of energy that needs these need these, yeah these conversations need to happen sorry did you want to yeah the part what i wanted to just say was about the gift of our uniqueness our difference our diversity that's the gift we're bringing you know and whatever was done to hurt or harm others based on a difference that is the fear that we are transmuting. And the more I know in myself it's not true, then the judgments and the hurt and the hate of others will not touch me in the same way. And I can see it as a projection that's coming out of their fear, not myself. And mm. I think that's an important learning, uh, continuous learning for myself also because I also can identi start identifying with these projections, internalized, externalized. And um, yeah, I think that's it. Absolutely, yes. And again, one last practical thing. If anybody's listening to this and doesn't have access to all the talks, please go to livingtheonelight.com so that you can sign up there for free these will be available indefinitely, um, 42 amazing talks, seriously amazing. And then all these, these panels will be um, on YouTube as well. So permanently. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So let's drop in for a minute. Mm. So to close this panel and to close the container, the immediate container of this, this entire symposium called Rebecoming the One, Healing of Our Relationships to Gender, Sexuality, Love, and Life Itself. What prayer or words do you feel called to speak into the space and into existence? Nikki, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, compassionate curiosity mm -hmm. for all that exists within, without. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Steve. My prayer is that everyone listening to this take on the practice of being kinder to themselves, mm -hmm. of being more forgiving of ourself, and allow that to naturally change the way that we relate to other people also with more kindness. Cameron. I said it earlier, so I'm still feeling the truth of it. Just being mindful where we get mixed up with our mind being in our head and actually remembering that the biggest like electromagnetic force that we have is in our heart. And so understanding that we actually have the most intelligence existing there. And so centering our body in the intelligence of nature, instead of being lost in a world of thought. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. Vivian. In our path to wholeness, remembering that the individual pieces feed the whole. So celebrate the differences, celebrate the uniqueness, celebrate the shadow and the light, the up and the down, celebrate you because the whole doesn't exist without every piece. Thank you. Nick. What comes to my mind 
is actually um, something from the Gospel of Thomas, when Jesus says something like to make the two into one and make the inner like the outer, uh, the outer like the inner, the above like the below, um, and the male like the female and the female like the male. And that is when you enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. You guys are making me cry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I want to say one thing, but I need to be able to speak. So hang on one second. Oh, um, I need to, well, okay. Um, yes, all of that. And <clears throat> I want to dedicate this entire symposium to our children. Um, to ourselves as children of the divine. And to remembering that wholeness and perfection that we are, even with the shadow, even with the trauma and the hurt on this planet, even with the conditioning and the messaging that has gone on for many centuries, millennia, that is continuing to go on on this planet. And I'm so grateful to each of you for being here as speakers, as people who are watching and listening and commenting and sending me messages about your children. I'm hearing from parents of transgender kids. I'm hearing from people who are really grateful for this forum on lots and lots of levels. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's beyond, beyond what I can say right now, especially because I can't talk very well. <laughs> um, to our children. Thank you, Martha, for bringing us all around this cauldron, this fire, this highlighting, illuminating it, and um, for all the speakers and on all the listeners. Thank you all for all of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I just want to read what's being said here in the chat really quick. Um, <clears throat> May we not take in the projections of others, be steady on ourselves, be connected to ourselves in body, light, and presence and allowance. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Um, and I'll just, I'll end with a quote from uh, Jason Engeldo in his talk. He, he made me cry. I've now cried twice in this whole symposium. <laughs> it was now <laughs> and at the end of his talk, because, oh my goodness, everybody needs to watch his talk. But what made me cry in his talk was when he said, uh, he's talking about himself, but really talking about all of us. I want to be, I want to show up as the ancestor to the future that I am. Mm -hmm. That's it. Like that's, that's mm -hmm. all of this, right? So yeah, to, to our children and to our future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.